lucky to have um, the Dean of Academics, Martin Verhoeven here to speak more about the pedagogy as well as Professor Stacy Chen, who's the Associate Dean of Program Development. Um, you might have gotten now some little pop-ups from Zoom. So we will be recording um, the event and we'll also be live streaming the presentation portion. Um, so like all of what you guys just shared right now wasn't streamed and won't be recorded either. Um, so without further ado, I'm just gonna share screen and um, just talk through briefly a little bit about some of um, what goes on here at DRBU and what are the things we offer. Um, so some of you may or may not know that, uh, so Dharma Realm Buddhist University is a liberal arts university located in Northern California. Um, one thing we had in the program description of, the, of this event tonight was that DRBU really focuses not just on learning something, but really about how to live more fully as a human. And I think that's something that carries across everything we do, whether it's in the classroom or outside the classroom, conversations you have with people in the community. Uh, because you guys can't be here on campus, I thought I'd just share a couple photos of what you might see around campus. We have a lot of deer roaming around. Um, it's not uncommon to see turkeys or peacocks even. We have actually quite a lot of peacocks and you start to learn interesting facts about peacocks, like how the noises they make, that they can actually fly a little bit. <laughs> Um, we also share our campus with the Buddhist monastery. So that adds really this whole other dimension to the university. We also share a campus with the K through 12 schools so that um, it really is like a very multi-generational greater community that you're in. And I think um, students, faculty, staff all benefit a lot from that kind of rich environment. Um, I'll, so just a little bit about the programs we offer at DRBU. We offer three academic programs. So we have the bachelor's in liberal arts, the master's in Buddhist classics, and the graduate certificate in Buddhist translation. The bachelor's in liberal arts is a four-year program. Um, so we offer one degree. There's no major. So it's a fully integrated program. You enter the program um, with a cohort and you study the same courses together. And it follows this great books model, which studies the classics and um, you study um, books ranging from Buddhist, Western, Indian, Chinese classics, science, math, music, language, and rhetoric and writing. For the master's program, it's a two-year program in Buddhist classics. And you'll take courses like Buddhist hermeneutics, comparative hermeneutics, Buddhist classics and language. Um, so there's this word like hermeneutics, which um, you'll probably hear a little bit more about, but really it's looking at what lens we're using to study things. And um, a really big emphasis is on how are we interpreting what we're reading and going through all the different factors and changes that might need to happen in order for us to better understand something that we're trying to read. And then there's the graduate certificate in Buddhist translation. So this is a one-year program and it focuses on translation th theory, hermeneutics again, and then also um, language. Uh, so that is just a quick run through of what we offer at DRB in terms of the degrees and programs. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Marty and Stacy will talk a little bit more about the pedagogy at DRBU and what it is that we're trying to do here. So I'll stop sharing screen so that you can all see each other's faces a little better. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Marty now and he'll speak a little bit. Yeah, I just turned the gallery back so I could see all of you. Um, well, welcome. I, I really wish we could do this in person. Um, but this is okay because if we were in person, we'd all be masked and we'd only see half each other's faces. So uh, being able to see all your faces is, is wonderful. And also um, the, the different places you're all from, it's amazing. Uh, the, the cosmopolitan grab bag of people that are drawn in. I, I'd love to sit here all night and listen to what 
drew you to this uh, institution, to this uh, educational program that we've got going, and, uh, but I can't. So I will just sort of cut to the chase. And this is really going to be a very fast um, bit of an overview, not covering probably all we could and all that you'd want to, but giving you a little bit of a flavor of sort of where we're coming from and what we're trying to do. Um, there's basically two models of education uh, out there and been out there for a long time since the ancient to the present. Uh, the Latin words that are used to describe them, one is educare, uh, and the other one is educare. You can see that education comes from both of those. The educare model is one that means to train or to inculcate, to, to fill up. Um, and it's basically specialized training to the some extent vocational, but its model is to make you into something like a functioning uh, tool. Uh, and in that model, the emphasis is on what to think and what to do. And this is passed along in a rather uh, top-down dogmatic way. The other model, a ducere, uh, means really to draw out, to release, to pull out. And instead of trying to form necessarily, it means to transform. It's trying to stretch and unlock potential. And it's aiming at educating the whole person as opposed to one dimension of the person. Um, and so instead of filling up, it's a filling out in the sense that it's a broadening and expanding and an enhancing of the whole person. Um, and instead of what to think, the emphasis on how to think. And instead of sort of pushing a model of what to do, it's, it's asking everybody in the program to think about how are we to know what to do or how to know to know what to do. Um, and that's a very different approach. And this is what makes it liberal. So just on a general level, liberal in that sense, in the classic liberal arts sense, is educating the whole person across a broad spectrum of knowledges um, and ways of knowing that allows them to interact critically uh, with the larger world, basically in all domains. Uh, not an expert in any one particular, but enough to have a good grasp of what it means to be an informed person in the modern world. And you think critically in that model, it's teaching you how to think uh, logically, analytically, intuitively, and I would say contemplatively as well, which is one of the key dimensions of our program is the uh, spiritual contemplative uh, faculty that we're trying, I didn't mean the faculty itself, but the faculty of the sensibility that we're trying to get. In the Buddhist sense, freedom not only has thinking for yourself, knowing how to think, very clear in the text that this is the goal, but it's also liberal in the sense of what in San, uh, Pali is called Vimuti Rasa, which is a wonderful taste of liberation that comes from the ending of confusion and suffering and knowing who you are and being really centered. Um, so the, the Buddhist aspect has that as well. Um, the famous philosopher Plutarch, I think, kind of hits at what we're trying to do in our program of activating inherent potential, activating inherent wisdom, activating inherent um, sort of moral compass and commitment. Uh, Plutarch said the mind is not a pail <laughs> or a bottle, if you will, to be filled, but rather a fire to be kindled. And this very much follows the Buddhist idea of developing an inherent capacity, kindling a fire uh, that the, the raw material, the fuel for that is already whole and complete in each one of us. And so again, in the educere model, this is to, to draw out. Uh, for Plutarch, it means creating an impulse to think independently and an ardent desire for truth. Now, I, I will say these two are not necessarily incompatible. They're not mutually exclusive, the educating for transformation and the education for training. And they should be integrated and there's an urgent need for that. But I have noticed in my years of working in this field that the trend is going for pale filling more and more. 
and pushing out the fire kindling model. Uh, higher education, what's called higher education, is increasingly becoming vocational training, and it is turning people into tools. This is something, a trend that we're trying to reverse. Um, how successful it will be, I don't know. Largely, it depends on you and how you uh, take advantage of this and use it to broaden and to develop intrinsic qualities. Uh, I would say, I think there's two major reasons for doing this, and I'm speaking generally now. One is in a democratic system or in a modern world, I would say it requires informed citizens on a broad range of issues and areas of ideas. Uh, we have power, but increasingly we're clueless how to wield that properly. And we have knowledge, but not the virtue to guide it. And so I think one of the greatest needs we have is inform people with critical thinking skills uh, that can actually engage and move the modern world, not simply follow its trends, but actually change and generate new trends. Uh, this kind of creative capacity. Uh, one of my favorite philosophers, John Dewey, said that democracy has to be born anew every generation and education is its midwife. The devotion of democracy to education is familiar to all of us, he said, and a government resting upon popular suffrage voting cannot be successful unless those who elect their governors are educated. So this is like the first level of why this broad-based liberal arts uh, education would be important for the modern world. And I think it's even more important now because I think you're, we are all suffering under a post-fact, post-truth phenomenon in society now. And that is not sustainable. That is not sustainable, and we know that. But there's another reason I would bring this up. And I think this has to do with more of the personal rather than the public. Um, and this is what drew me to a liberal arts education when I was 16 and 17, and I still think uh, it holds. Meaning, value, purpose, joy, and a rich and curious, fulfilling life. All that matters to being a person, to becoming a person. The current around the world right now, you can see there's millions of people who are rethinking how they work and live, and mostly of your generation. Um, how to balance, get these two in line. Uh, in the United States, the term is the great resignation. I think this is not a Buddhist term, by the way. It's a, it's a sociological term. The great resignation means you have U.S. workers putting their jobs in record numbers. More than 24 million did from April to September this year. 24 million people quit. And it's not just because of COVID, but it's coming from a deep alienation, a, a loss of meaning. Um, there's a famous line from T.S. Eliot that says, kind of as his life got empty, I measured out my life in coffee spoons. And here it's, I've measured out my life in Starbucks cups. It's that feeling of driving this resignation. Also, those of you familiar with China, there's something called the lie fat, flat movement. I don't know the Chinese word for that, lie flat. Um, but it's, um, it was jump-started by a social media post from which it got its name. But it's about opting out, people not buying in uh, to the system. Uh, it's a reaction against what is called this grueling uh, in Chinese, uh, Zhou Zhou Liu, 996, work schedule means 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. Whoa. And it's common in industries like technology. So this unrelenting pressure from family and from society and even the government to keep climbing the ladder. And I would say a ladder that really never reaches the top and where each rung still feels empty, like I'm not there yet. So it's about an economy that's become overheated and unsustainable, but also not just in the environmental sense, but in a mental sense, in the psychological, emotional sense. And so I think this is a larger reason why people might be interested in stepping out a bit and reorienting on a liberal arts education to reconfigure and reimagine what their lives might be driven by a different dimension than the 996 sort of phenomena. Um, I suppose I shouldn't go on too much more. <laughs> Uh, the topic changed tonight. Brenda originally had it as 
embodied learning, and then it became uh, knowing things as they are. Um, and so I'm just sort of waffling in between these various topics to uh, just sort of share with you. Um, I would say this, that DRBU is not just a series of courses, nor even simply a physical, philosophical way of thinking, but it's a way of being a person. The faculty feels that we are not just teaching courses, we're teaching and relating to people. And I hope that you feel that you will not be just taking courses, but you'll be in a transformative place where you're getting to know yourself and transform yourself through this process. The famous French philosopher Pierre Hadot put it this way. He said, this kind of learning is not just studying philosophy, it is philosophy as a way of life. And so what we're trying to do is in our way um, is to get away from this idea of what higher education has become is divided learning and divided knowledge, where the curriculum is fragmented to increasingly unrelated disciplines and subdisciplines, and more importantly, where the student him or herself is left divided. Mind, body, intellect, emotion, fact, value, matter, spirit, these splitting ups of our identity and awareness to the point where many, if not most students can actually graduate today without any meaningful vision or sense of purpose, or worse, any compass by which to find such a purpose. So embodied learning tries to reverse this trend and I would say higher education now and modern life, kind of characterized by an absence of a coherent ethical code. And then this problem of a fragmented sense of being and then a lack of a meaningful sense of purpose in one's life. And also then the ability to form genuine community to socially related in. And so I would think maybe I would say it may not be for everybody. It's a niche um, approach. It is very ancient and very modern at the same time. This is not something you know new under the sun, but it's a reenactment or a revitalization of something that held sway for a long time of what it meant to be a full and educated person. And it may be the only chance you have in your entire life to slow down, to read deeply, uh, to listen to yourself, to think things over, and maybe set or reset your lives on a meaningful course. Obviously, the reading part is huge. We're using largely classical text in both the undergraduate and graduate program because we find these to be addressing the abiding questions of humanity. They're both timely and timeless. But I will just give you two quotes to end um, from two people you might know. The first quote on this is from James Baldwin, the famous American um, Black author. And he said, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world. But then you read, it was books that taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all people who were alive and who ha had ever been alive. And then finally, um, a quote that I like from uh, Maya Angelou. She says, when I look back, I'm so impressed again with the life-giving power of literature. If I were a young person today trying to gain a sense of myself in the world, I would do that again by reading, just as I did when I was young. So that's about all in the time I have. Um, I wish we had time to chat and go into more, but I hope that gives you a little bit of the flavor of what we're trying to do. Thanks, Marty. Um, before, Stacy, did you wanna mention something real quick? Uh, sure, I can, should I go now, Brenda, or? Um, yeah, well, actually, okay, let me, okay. Reverend Hungshire actually had a, had a comment for Marty. Maybe we can go to Reverend Hungshire. Sure. Hey, hey, Marty. Um, hey. I think uh, that was, that was lovely. Uh, I think you lit some fires. Um, I think a lot of people are coming to the open house to find out about the Buddhist word of the title, Dharma Realm Buddhist. Do you want to give two minutes on how the education for the whole person then prepares you for Buddhist practice and what's available at DRBU? I could say a little bit. Um, everybody knows 
the undergraduate program has different strands. It has an Indian strand, Chinese uh, strand, uh, a Western strand has a science strand. Um, what am I leaving out? Mathematics um, and a number of others that are classical liberal arts. The Buddhist MA is only focused on classical Buddhist texts. We'll be reading, you're reading texts um, in translation, but also with language support from Sanskrit and Chinese and increasingly Pali now being added so that you can read the text directly for yourselves, uh, get to those original teachings and then start thinking about them. But more than just thinking about them, there's a laboratory to aspect to the program there which has to do with the blending of study and practice, of contemplative practice along with rigorous textual study. This goes back to an idea from the great uh, Chintai master, Zhu Yi, who said, basically, if you practice, but you don't study, it's blind. And if you study, but don't practice, it's sterile. Study and practice are like the two wings of a bird. Both are needed for the bird to take flight, and both in the Buddhist sense are necessary for deep understanding and transformation. So the Buddha side of this um, really has the blending of those two. Um, I don't know if I could say any more about that, but it's essentially a two-year program where you're reading primary text, you're learning how to read primary text, you're deeply engaged in immersive contemplative exercises and trying to integrate this all into a holistic experience of the Dharma in a sense, the way it was meant to be taught the way it was meant to be transmitted uh, in a living, engaged, uh, interactive tradition of study and practice. So I think that's more than enough for a, for a sample. <laughs> thanks for asking. Thanks, Marty. And thanks for the question, Reverend Hungshir. So Stacy has a little bit to share now, so I'll pass it off to Stacy. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Marty. Um, so I think I want to share in terms of what, what really drew me to DRVU and what really excites me about our pedagogy. And the way I was thinking about it while listening to Marty is um, in, in higher education, a lot of us, when we are trained um, in the traditional academy, um, have to, I feel like there is almost a separation between the heart and the head. Um, and in fact, the more one study, the more the, the higher one goes um, in in uh, in one's education. It's almost like that separation becomes wider and wider. Um, yet the education at DRBU actually seeks to bring them back together, and not only bring it back together, it actually claims that um, it's inseparable to begin with, um, and that this idea of um, philosophy as a way of life, which Marty mentioned of the philosopher Pierre Hado, and I wanted to, sh I have this book. This is a book that uh, both our undergraduate and our master students read, and that Hado has this idea that ancient philosophy actually are not, um, they are not simply metaphysical or ideological or conceptual um, frameworks, but they are actually written to transform our lives um, and to, inf um, to form us. And so I want to share, let's see, I have two quotes recently. I just read, reread a chapter of this text with the undergraduate and these are stuff that really jumped out at me. Uh, can I share screen? Okay. Yeah, sorry, let's make you co-host. Oh wait, actually, Megan, can you do that? I don't think I have permission. And, um, okay, Stacy, you're good. Thank you. Okay, let me see. So um, this is kind of very, um, so Hado here um, argues that philosophy appears in its original aspect, with not as a theoretical construct, like a, you know, but as a method for training us how to live and how to look at the world in a new way. Um, it is an attempt to transform humankind. And in that transformation at DRBU, we ask big questions like, what does it mean to live well? Um, 
how how do we how do we relate to each other um, as in a community? Um, and what is happiness? What is virtue? This morning I was reading, we were, we were reading Aristotle with our students, and that was this question we were investigating. Aristotle asked, well, what, is, what does it mean to be virtuous? What does it mean to live a good life? Um, do, how, do, how does one choose how to act and how to live a virtuous life? And, you can, and that all of these questions really for me as a, um, in a way as, as an instructor at DRBU brings my, brings my heart with my head together and investigate this, these questions with our students um, in a very meaningful way. And uh, Marty was mentioning a lot of times uh, that we think, we think of study and practice almost as, um, as independent things, um, especially sometimes in school, we have to study and then maybe we practice or, or do our contemplation on the side. Um, but at DRBU, not only do we emphasize both, again, we actually bring them um, together. And it's, it's, it's um, Hado has another quote, which, uh, uh, let me see. Oh. Maybe it's this one. Okay. No, oopsie. Okay. I think you can all see how low check we are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm normally not like this. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is a second quote. And this again was one of when I was going through the, the text. And you know, Hado, Hado talks about talks about actually the the mere activity of reading itself is a spiritual exercise. And he says that we have forgotten how to read, how to pause, liberate ourselves from our worries, return into ourselves, and leave aside our search for subtlety and originality in order to meditate calmly, ruminate, and let the text speak to us. This too is a spiritual exercise and one of the most difficult. Um, I just simply love how Hado puts it because he's saying that, well, actually how to read. Reading is a, is a meditative process in which we actually take the time to pause um, in that we leave behind any agendas any even wanting to get at meaning um, um, and return into our most authentic self, even leaving aside um, our hopes and our of wanting to search for subtlety and originality, but simply just meditate with the text and let the text speak to us as it is. Um, and that he's saying that this practice is a spiritual exercise and one of the most difficult. So that's, I think, all I want to share with you tonight, and I'll turn it back to Brenda. Thanks, Stacey, for those quotes. Yeah, definitely that book was probably one of my favorites in the program. Um, so we have a little bit more time here. I actually wanted to see if any of you all had questions for Marty or Stacey, um, you know, especially kind of on the pedagogy, how what the education model is like at DRBU. Um, just wanna open it up right now. If you have any questions, um, you can write down in the chat. Um, we'll give you some time to let the question simmer up. Or maybe it was so comprehensive, nobody has any questions. <laughs> so Marty and Stacy did a great no, job. No, 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 give me a break. <laughs> I, can, I can tell by the faces, this is a deeply questioning group. <laughs> yes, so definitely don't be shy. Um... One of the things we do on the Buddha side is to really emphasize not only the legitimacy, but the importance of questions. If you look at the life of the Buddha, it began with questions and doubt, it pursued itself through questions and doubt, and it was through questions and doubting that there was a full awakening. So questioning and looking into things deeply and wondering and this curiosity is at the heart of Buddhist learning, of Buddhist education. Without questions, there's no learning. So even though we talk about lighting the fire, there has to be a spark 
inside each one of you. And I'm sure it's there. Uh, and that's called curiosity. It's called questioning. And it's not destructive doubt. It's constructive doubt. So even if you're not there tonight, be, be prepared that if you come, uh, this will be a platform that you'll be running on. Questioning, questioning, examining. Well, if there's no questions, I'm, I'm gonna probably leave because I got a niece whose birthday is today and she's expecting a call from her uncle, um, not to give her any wisdom, but to give her some trinkets. So I'm gonna have to leave you all unless there's a, a question. Go ahead, anybody have a question? Yeah, Sophie has a question. Sophie Huang? Yes, hi. Um, I, just, I, I just wanted to um, express my gratitude of the, all of the words that's been talked about. <laughs> uh, and most importantly, I don't want Mar Marty to leave. Um, but anyways, so <laughs> um, I really like that you touched upon all the uh, social norms of like quitting culture and the lay flat thing uh, culture in China right now, because I, I, I wouldn't say I'm part of the quit quitters, but um, that is constantly on my mind these days. Um, you know, I'm, I'm midlife working in the conventional way. And I am definitely thinking about taking time off just to do something for my life. And part of it is considering applying for DRVU MA program. Um, so, which is, I guess this is the exact forum for people like me, but I want maybe one of you or all of you can expand a little bit about, because it is really a big decision for people like me, midlife, uh, mid-career to take time to study a new, sort of a new way of life really through the program. And I wanted to see how that you would imagine that would um, benefit and you know, change people or help them um, in, in my situation. And I imagine there's quite a bit of people like me too. I'll just make a quick comment and turn it over to say, you're right, Sophie, there's a lot of people like you in our program. And it's not just 19 and 20 year olds, it's 30 and 40 and 50 and plus year olds. Sometimes it takes a while to figure out that this isn't working. <laughs> you know, we've been so programmed to think, keep climbing the ladder, keep climbing the ladder. And it's, you know, every time it's getting more and more empty. So it takes a kind of courage, but also at the same time, life is short. So, you know, if you don't grab it now, it may not come around again. Uh, there's a wonderful expression in Buddhism. Sometimes a retreat is an advance. Mm. And sometimes a going forward is actually a retreat. So I wouldn't worry about that. Um, I would worry, be true to your heart and follow it and you will be fine. Um, only worry that you'll look back and regret that you didn't you know, seize this moment when the fire was hot. But that's, that's my encouragement to you. Um, it's how I live my life and I'm, well, you know, whatever that means, <laughs> here I am. Uh, so on that though, I think there's a lot of people here who could talk and Megan could talk about that. So could Brenda herself and Stacy. So. I'm gonna say goodbye to you all. I hope to see you all again. It was nice to see you. Some of you I recognize um, in many ways. It's really, really nice to see all your faces. So hopefully we'll meet again. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Marty. Okay, so we'll, I'll share a little bit more. Um, we have like, I wanna to definitely touch upon some more aspects of the application process at DRBU. And then we'll also have some more time at the end for any questions people might have about general things at DRBU. Um, it looks like there's already some in the chat box. So we'll make sure we definitely get to those. Um, one thing I really wanted to mention about our um, admissions process, let me just start at the slideshow. Um, so I, I like, you know, Sophie was kind of mentioning like, a, a serious concern attending a university like DRBU where it's like really not clear, like what, what can I do with this afterwards? Um, I think one thing that definitely helps is that we're very committed to access and affordability. So if a student um, 
demonstrates a serious interest in DRBU and they've been accepted to DRBU, we meet 100% of their demonstrated financial need. Um, so this has allowed all of our students so far to graduate without any debt. Um, and we're able to do this through our service scholarship program. So students help out in all different departments at DRBU from the farm to cleaning, to the kitchen, um, to student activities. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's kind of puts graduates in a really good position because then they're actually able, you know, they can feel more free to do what they wanna do after they graduate and aren't faced with, you know, piles and piles of debt. Um, I want also to mention that we have our regular missions deadline coming up in a week. Um, and then after that, we'll have rolling admissions until class fills. Um, and yeah, I wanted to now see, well, there's a couple actually. Um, I do want to mention that we have class visits available for prospective students. So, you know, kind of tonight, you got to feel from Marty Stacy a little bit about our pedagogy. Um, but I think definitely being in person or even you can there, we also have some online options for visiting classes, just getting more of a feel of what it's actually like to be in the classroom. Um, and we actually have an event coming up on March 22nd. It's a Tuesday from 8 to 9 p.m. Um, and it it's called How Does One Know What Is Required to Truly Know Thyself? And it'll be um, a shared inquiry discussion style event. So we'll send out some very short readings ahead of time. And then you'll kind of just be able to really experience what it's like to be in our DRBO classroom. We'll have faculty there leading the discussion. Um, and yeah, it's a, you can kind of like see what kind of questions are we asking and like how, how the faculty kind of push and probe a little bit more to have you rethink things and refocus your discussion. So we'll share that info in the chat box and then also by email. Um, but yeah, and then for now, I wanted to see, yeah, if there's any other questions, there actually are quite a few questions in the chat box. So let me just get back to them. We had a question about the class size from Spiro Dukas about how many students does the average class size have? And um, there's definitely a little bit of range, but we the classes are very small and very intimate. Um, there's an average about eight to 12. The master's classes, I believe are capped at 10 to 12 students and the bachelor's is capped at 15, but generally they've been um, smaller. So it's really allows for there's a lot of um, attention and intimate learning environment. There's a question from Jin Xie about what is the actual average time to finish the two-year program? And then it looks like the second question was cut off. Um, for the first one, maybe I'll ask Megan, she can help answer that question. Um. Yeah, the, we don't offer our programs on a part-time basis. Um, so all the programs do require kind of progressing through them full-time. And there's a number of reasons for that. One is that when you come in as a DRBU student, you are become part of a cohort. So all the students who enter that year become your classmates. And all the classes that you take, you take together. And this is by design because what it allows to happen is that all the things you're reading and discussing get to build on each other semester by semester. Um, and so the things that you might have discussed in one class when you're reading, for example, from like the Pali Buddhist canon can naturally and seamlessly transition into Western philosophy. Um, the things you're reading in language or working on maybe in translation and language might be playing into one of your other courses. And the kind of conversation can really flow from the classroom into the hallway into you know, the meal time and so on. Um, and so we really um, put a lot of um, kind of emphasis on that in-person learning and, and getting to be part of a community um, where you are gonna find people who come from so many different walks of life, but somehow have something in, deep in common. Um, and, and there's a lot of really interesting dynamicism um, about being in all these classes together 
um, with your cohort. And then of course, making friends outside of that with other people in various other years of the program or in other programs. Um, so yeah, the, the average time to complete the program is, um, is two years for the master's program, um, since we don't have any kind of alternative uh, options available. Thanks, Megan. Uh, okay, so Echo has a question. Would you have a prior learning recognition process? I have a BA degree, but wonder if I can study another degree. Um, are you, maybe Echo, could you clarify the question? Do you mean, could you study another bachelor's degree or? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. I was wondering, actually I'm interested originally in the MA degree, mm -hmm. but I was looking at your curricula for BA program and sound marvelous. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, I'm also practical about timing and wondering if I can, my first degree, uh, some of the common credits may be translatable. Yeah, that's a great question. You're, you're definitely not the first person who has a bachelor's degree and wants to do the bachelor's degree because it really is, um, you know, a much more diverse curriculum. Um, so in terms of like transfer credits, so DRBU does not, because the, the, the program is fully integrated, um, we don't accept any transfer credits. Um, however, with the, like with the bachelor's degree, you can of course, um, do the master's program, which is a two-year program. But yeah, unfortunately for the bachelor's program, we do not accept any transfer credits. Thank you. Um, let's see. Okay, Jin, I think the next question is Jin, from Jinsia who asks, is there's a prerequisite for the language? So um, none of the language courses have prerequisites. So when students enter, um, you start at the beginning of the language sequence. Um, if you do have previous experience, you can place out of certain levels, um, but definitely most people come in without any language experience and then, you know, everyone's kind of treated as um, starting from the beginning. So, yeah, definitely no need to have any prior language experience. Um, Ling Ling Zhao, okay, could you please talk about the translation program a little bit more? Does DRBU provide hybrid mode teaching or online teaching for people who has a job? Okay, I'll address the first part about the translation program. So yeah, the translation program is a newer program. Um, it's a one-year program. Um, you take courses on translation theory. So looking at different philosophers um, across different cultures actually and how they approach translation. What are the issues to look at? Um, so there's one course on that. There's one course called Hermeneutics of Self, which really kind of comes, follows a lot of DRBU pedagogy in that to really understand what you're reading, you also have to look at, well, who's the reader? And so for translation, you also have to look at, well, who's the translator? Because they play a very big role in the act of translation. So the Hermeneutics of Self course looks at different texts that allow you to investigate that more and also integrate some contemplative practices as well. Um, and then another big portion of the translation program is actually hands-on translation work. So you work um, in teams um, and individually, primarily um, people translate from classical Chinese into English, but as people's, as the students, you know, language capabilities are different from year to year, we do offer also other options like translating into Spanish or French or translating from Sanskrit. Um, so that's a little bit more of the translation program. And yeah, okay, maybe the second question we'll we can ask Stacy answer since she we have her here. So does DRBU provide hybrid mood teaching or online teaching for people who have a job? Um, DRBU, um, do not um, have um, a formal hybrid mode teaching, online teaching as a program, but of course COVID changed many, many things. And because of COVID, many of our classes had to be um, moved online for the past year. Um, and that we, we 
last fall, we brought most of our students back on campus. And um, with it, with the exception of translation program, which is still running in a hybrid mode, but uh, the intent is that DRBU is really an in-person community and all of our program is really best uh, done in person. And I think the COVID taught us so much that by going into online, we lose, we lose, we lose the human element of it. When we are all together in the room, uh, even with our mask on, we can see each other, we can actually feel each other's energy, we can read each other's um, um, uh, um, uh, emotions and feelings and respond to each other so much better than just online. Um, online, uh, there's a lot of, there's a feeling of disconnect that our students are reporting. And so in the model of that, we're hope, you know, in, in, in which we're, we're reading, reading text as a way of life, as a way of being, um, our pedagogy is really best uh, done in person. Um, so DRBU programs are designed to be in person. Uh, of course, uh, we'll see how we, we were, we don't know how long COVID will last. Um, so everything is according to conditions at this point. But as of this semester, all both of the MA and BA programs are back in person. Um, the translation program is still operating in hybrid. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Stacy. Uh, we have a question from Venerable Peng Kuang. So you got an email saying that the deadline is February 15th for the bachelor program. And yes, yeah, so the regular admission deadline for um, both programs is February 15th. However, um, after that, if you don't happen to make the deadline, we do have rolling admissions until the class is filled. So if you don't happen to make it in before February 15th, definitely don't worry too much about it. You can still submit it afterwards and we'll just process it as it comes in. Um, Okay, this question from Wen Bo Yin, but besides attending classes at DRBU, can we go to and participate in activities in the monastery and other places at CTTP? It's a great question. Megan, you wanna take that one? Um, yeah, we, uh, for those who maybe kind of aren't so familiar with our campus environment, I'll use this as an opportunity to just take a little bit of a step back. Um, so we're located in Ukiah, California. And we share our campus with uh, the city of 10,000 Buddhas, which is often called CTTB. So you hear that all the time, CTTB, city of 10,000 Buddhas. And um, the city of 10,000 Buddhas is home to many different activities. DRBU, the university is one. There's also a monastery. So um, Buddhist monks and nuns um, live here and practice here. We also have a K through 12 school. Um, so uh, grade school, high school, we have uh, solar, solar panel farm and organic food farm and all sorts of other things that are going on here. Um, and yes, if you uh, are a student at DRBU, um, you are welcome to participate in, in many of the activities of the monastery and um, including going to the Buddha hall and participating in the kind of daily rhythms and daily um, ceremonies and functions of the monastery if you choose to. Um, of course, like Stacy said, we're in times of COVID, there's like extra safety per cautions we have in place right now to try to keep everybody safe. And one of those is that we've been doing like a bubble system. So trying to have different bubbles so that we don't um, kind of overextend our exposure and try to keep folks safe. So that has meant a kind of reduction in just like the openness of the campus. Um, and But we're hoping, you know, over time um, that the that things will kind of continue to open and, and we'll be able to um, share more space together again. Um, and in the meantime, you know, DRBU has been running um, meditation and various spiritual activities kind of within our bubble um, that students are, are welcome to, to plug into if they choose to. Thanks, Megan. Uh, so there's a question from Adi about how many foreign students do you accept? I don't have that number offhand um, in terms of acceptance. I'm checking, um, I think we do have the number. Okay, so we have 27% of students are international students. Um, the number of accepted, I don't have that data, but probably somewhere around there. So about a third of students that are currently attending are international students. 
Um, and Smith, yes, there is an opportunity to volunteer at the K through 12 schools. Um, oh, actually, yeah, okay, Omar can share a little bit about that. You definitely can. I'm actually uh, just graduated from the school and I'm helping out at the, at the boys' school. So there's definitely that connection. Yeah, and I think students have a range of ways that they can help out from tutoring to actually even teaching a course if you have, you know, the background and want to take that on. Um, but yeah, definitely a lot of opportunity to interact with different ages. It's really quite wonderful. The one We had one student who was volunteering for a while, helping out the elderly nuns um, because she had some nursing background. Um, so really a lot of um, different ways to plug into the community. Um, okay, does anybody else have any final questions? Um, if not, it was really wonderful to see everybody here. Um, I'll we'll send an email out with the link to the recording of this event as well as information on the shared inquiry discussion event. If, you, if you're at all interested in um, learning a little bit more of what it's like in the classroom, it's a really great opportunity, I think, to just get a taste of um, the classroom dynamic. Um, yeah, if I think that might be all, I'll let people get on with their evenings. Um, if people wanna turn on their video to say goodbye, that'd be great. Otherwise, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Um, it was a wonderful global representation we had tonight. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good evening. Bye.